Um, I'll start with the data, except I won't start with the data because um, somehow the transmission hasn't got through. But you know what they are. It's really what's happened to the world economy in the last four years. I mean, you had this big collapse, 2008, banking collapse, which infected everything. Then you had a stimulus in uh, 2000, end of 2008, early 2009, which became a global, coordinated global stimulus in April 2009. Then you had a, then you had a, a, a recovery, not a strong recovery, but um, still a recovery. And since then, the world economy has become increasingly disarticulated. Um, some bits are growing, um, but the bits that I think we're most concerned with in, not only in Ireland, but in the United Kingdom and in the Euro, in the European area, are, are actually not growing, and since uh, 2010 have been flatlining, if not shrinking. So that's the background tool, that's the data bit of it. Um, well, now I, you know, um, go to what's happened in the last few days. Mr. Cameron, the British Prime Minister, returned from holiday vowing to get Britain moving again, something politicians often say. And there was no admission, of course, that its immobility over the last two years had anything to do with the policies pursued by his government or by his Chancellor of the Exchequer. Well, I think we have to th remember one or two facts. Between 2008 and 2009, the British economy shrank by 6% about. Um, then from the start of 2010, it did get moving again. Uh, but nine months later, it flattened out, and since then um, has um, stayed the same or been shrinking a little bit in the last three quarters. And I wonder why uh, we've had this... Uh, this uh, alternation. In the spring 2009, as I said, all the major economies, including uh, the British, were given a large stimulus. And as a result, there was a bit of growth. In, in, June, uh, in June 2010, uh, Osborne came in with his austerity package and, um, and um, you uh, got the end of growth. Now, I know a correlation isn't a cause. Um, uh, but uh, the coincidences are quite striking. Um, it could be that the recovery had something to do with the previous stimulus and the flatlining or shrinking has had something to do with austerity. I'm going to return to that later on. At any rate, um, these uh, coincidences deserve close examination. In the whole debate that's, been, that's going on, it's wonderful how people clutch at straws. For example, um, there's been a fall um, in retail sales in July in the UK, and that's been attributed to the fact that people prefer to watch the Olympics rather than to go shopping. Um, well, it might just be that they had less money to spend, but um, that uh, um, was not, um, wasn't prominent in the explanation. Um, now I just heard yesterday that more and more shops are closing in Margate, Yorkshire. Uh, one third have closed in the last two months. Now, perhaps this is due to the rapt attention people are giving to the Paralympics. <laughs> you know, people will always um, try and um, um, deny um, the obvious um, set of explanations in, in an effort to hold on to um, hope. Um, the government clutches its straws of its own. Yes, I'm quoting here, I know the going's getting tough, um, but we were derailed by the Eurozone crisis. Um, that's camera. Sorry, the dates are wrong. British recovery petered out before the European crisis started. It actually petered out, petered out as soon as the coalition started. Um, but surely, um, it was only the government's austerity policy which has prevented Britain from going the way of those big European spenders, profligate spenders in, in, in the Eurozone. And again, I quote Cameron, <clears throat> when I first became prime minister, our market rates were the same as Spain's. Ours are now less than 2%. Theirs are more than 6%. Why? 
because we threw a lifeline around the British economy and pulled back um, from the cliff edge. Yes, yeah, sounds good. But wait a minute. Spain had a budget surplus and a low public debt in the run-up to the crisis, a better fiscal position than Britain. And since then, Spain has followed roughly the same austerity policy as that of the United Kingdom. So how can the difference in how the market treat the United Kingdom and Spain be down to the policies of their national governments? Well, at least it's a question. Um, but now we come to some good news. Um, yes, again I quote, growth has been disappointing, but in the last two years we've also seen more than 900,000 jobs created in the private sector. Well, that's a tricky one. First of all, the number of jobs created is neither here nor there. It's net, net jobs you need, uh, you need to um, uh, 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 look at. But leave that aside for the moment. First, the Prime Minister doesn't tell us how many of these 900,000 private sector jobs are full-time jobs and how many are part-time jobs. According to the TUC, the number of adults who have a job but would like to work more hours than they do actually work has risen by um, a 1 million since 2008. 1 million people have lost their jobs completely since 2008, and a further 1 million have lost part of their jobs. They don't work as many hours as they want to to get the income they need to get by. And it's a reasonable hunch, and I think there are data, we don't have very good data about this, that a large proportion of the new private sector jobs, which Mr. Cameron congratulates himself on, are part-time. Now, I agree, some employment is better than no employment, but it's hardly the resounding success story it's made out to be. And second, the, 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 the 900,000 new private sector jobs haven't been all created by the coalition. A lot of them were actually being created by the less austere policies of the previous government, but they've been counted in the total. And it would be more reasonable to say that the coalition has created 500,000 new jobs, both full-time and part-time. Um, there's still a puzzle. And it's the puzzle that enables the government to take some com comfort from these figures. It takes comfort from the fact that the percentage of unemployment in the UK has risen less than the output of the economy has shrunk. Um, the headline figure of 2.56 million unemployed is actually slightly lower than it was a, six months ago, although the economy has been shrinking somewhat since then. So what is the explanation for that? Well, I think the best one I've heard is the one um, given by a Guardian editorial, which put it this way. It now requires many more of us to labor away to churn out the reduced quantity of stuff. So productivity has fallen quite substantially. And, um, and, and, I think, um, and I think that explains um, the apparent divergence between the two sets of figures. Output and employment are not moving in exactly the same direction. As I said, all this is clutching at straws. Um, the present situation in both our countries is the predictable and by some of us predicted outcome of the policies pursued by governments um, since, uh, the, uh, since at least 2010. Um, and so we, I think some of us predicted that we'd be in exactly this situation that we are now two years ago. And that prediction rests on a straightforward Keynesian analysis, which I now come to. Keynes explained, well, it's all for, it's probably most of it is familiar to you, but it's worth going through it again just to tease out its, its basic logic. Keynes explained how underemployment equilibrium gets established. We can easily apply it to the present situation. Um, we start 
uh, from a situation of full employment, but with a large number of highly indebted people. That doesn't matter. The, the, the ratio of debt to income doesn't matter as long as the economy is growing at a satisfactory rate. But suddenly, the next step up the ladder is no longer there, and a lot of people find they're now living beyond their means. The only thing they can do is to spend less and save more, or save more. But what happens if all households and firms try to increase their saving at the same time? Well, then the total spending in the economy will fall, since everyone's spending is someone else's income. There will be less demand for goods and services, and therefore labor. Our collective attempts to get back into balance, get rid of our credit card debt, as uh, Mr. Cameron likes to put it, will in fact make us all poorer. And in fact, reduce the amount of saving as well since we will have smaller incomes out of which to save. So the economy will go on shrinking until the excess saving is eliminated by the growing poverty of the community. The essence of this insight of Keynes, and it was a profound insight that went right against the orthodoxy of the day, the essence of this um, insight is captured in the phrase, the fallacy of composition. The fallacy consists in believing that the whole adds up to the sum of the uh, uh, that the whole adds up to the sum of the parts. The most famous application of that fallacy, of course, is the paradox of thrift, which I've just been describing. Individual saving is good <coughs> under many circumstances, but if we all try to save at the same time, the community will grow poorer and not richer. And that's why Keynes rejected more saving as a remedy for a slump. The correct response is more spending. And if private agents lack the resources to increase their own spending, as is, only, as is very likely as their incomes fall and they find it increasingly hard to get loans, then the government needs to increase its own spending. And that is, an, in a nutshell, is the theory of the stimulus. Unless the government does that, then I think you get underemployment equilibrium. And that, it's equilibrium. No equilibrium lasts forever. There are always changes, but it can last a hell of a long time. And while it lasts, you have a destruction of productive capacity going on for every year that the underemployment equilibrium lasts because skills are being destroyed, plant is being destroyed, and therefore the potential, growth potential, is lower than it would have been. <coughs> Let me put it another way. Debt is simply that ratio of what I owe to my income. I can try to reduce this ratio either by saving more or by growing my income. The government faces exactly the same problem with the national debt. The government's income, after all, is drawn from the income of the community. If by trying to save more of its own income, which of course is what is meant by cutting its spending, uh, it reduces the income of the community, it reduces its own income. Uh, so its, its debt will not go down, in fact, will rise, is likely to rise, and that is what has been happening. The revenues of most Eurozone governments, including those of Ireland, have been for some time on a downward trend, and they haven't been able to reduce their spending by nearly as much as they hoped to. <coughs> Fortunately, they haven't been able to reduce their spending as much as they'd hoped to, because if they had, our economies would have been shrinking even faster. So, we seem to be between a rock and a hard place. The international organizations, the IMF and the OECD, are more or less agreed that present austerity policies are stopping growth. Let me offer a couple of quotations. Here is Mr. Angel, Hung, Angel Gurria, uh, Secretary General of the OECD. I'm quoting, deleveraging necessarily means higher savings, and that means lower consumption, and therefore lower demand. 
And the lower demand means even lower employment and even lower incomes for households and lower revenues from governments. And both of these mean slower deleveraging. It is a vicious circle. I know uh, Angel Gurria quite well, and we've talked about this a lot of the time. And he, I mean, he's instinctively a Keynesian, as you can see, and he's finally got that kind of sentiment into the OECD um, uh, report. But OECD has been, is largely financed by governments who don't believe this. And so he's had a difficult part to play. And the same is true of the IMF. Here is the IMF's, a late, the latest IMF study. About Britain, it says, <clears throat> the recovery has stalled and unemployment is still too high. Additional macroeconomic easing is needed to close the output gap faster. Scaling back fiscal tightening plans should be the main policy lever if growth does not build momentum by early 2013, even after further monetary stimulus and strong credit easing measures. The output gap, the one thing that the the current, the current orthodoxy denies is that there is an output gap. You might think, well, of course there's an output gap. Output has been falling. There's quite a lot of extra unemployment. There must be some output gap. Oh, no, 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 no. The economy is at full potential. It's just that the potential is less than we thought it was. So, but here are official organizations who actually are calling a spade a spade. And of course, governments have started to be influenced. For a Keynesian, these insights are hardly news, because that's exactly what Keynes argued, um, but would, would be the case. But governments have had to do, had to contemplate U-turns, because their policies have not been working. They can't admit that they're turning, like the lady, we're not for turning, but they, ha they are turning, nevertheless. Um, and um, hence Cameron's call to cut out the dither. But there's still a great deal of disagreement about what form the turning should take. And I just want to end with the state of the debate as it now is. And that debate is broadly between the supply-siders and the demand-siders. The supply-siders argue that the way to get the economy moving again is to reduce the cost of doing business. Hence, their demand for cutting red tape, which is a standard kind of thing, cutting out the waste, cutting out the red tape, you know, the ability to get things done, Cameron was on about this a great deal. It's impossible to get things done. There are all these bureaucratic regulations, red tape, and, 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 and the inefficiencies, especially of the public sector, and, <clears throat> and the various schemes for reducing the cost of borrowing for businesses, uh, like the government's new loan guarantee scheme. I think one strand in the, in, in the debate going on right from the beginning is the role of monetary policy. And monetary policy, I think a Keynesian would support expansionary monetary policy for demand reasons. But he, a Keynesian would say that money supply has to expand in, in the course of any recovery. But it's, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition because there's um, a lot of, um, you know, you can lead the horse to water but you can't get it to drink. And I think the, um, the, the, the evidence about quantitative easing as it's coming through from the United States and, and, and the UK, in Eurozone, there hasn't been nearly as much quantitative easing because of the, of the, the constitution of the European Central Bank. But the evidence coming through from the UK and the United, uh, UK and, and the United States is that it's had some effect in, 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 in stopping the fall of economies. There's been what's called a wealth effect. I mean, the, 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 the um, guilt rates have been reduced by about 1%. And that, of course, has meant that there's been some wealth created by, by the buyers of the bonds. Uh, 
for the buyers of the bonds. And so, you know, there is some effect, but it's not a very great effect. And I think Keynes also foresaw this. In 1932, he said, um, I think he said, what's the quotation? He said, so it still may be the case that banks are asking more um, for uh, loans, shattered by their experience, are asking more for loans that borrowers can afford, can afford to take out um, because of their profit, ex profit expectations. So I think that's been a, a, a quite, um, a quite uh, um, frequent observation, that the money is coming out, but it's somehow not getting into the economy. Uh, businesses are still finding the spread between um, the, the guilt rates and the rates at which they um, can borrow a lar large, even though they have fallen a little bit, but they're still historically large. So monetary policy, um, which, which um, the OECD looks to as the first, um, first sort of type of expansionary policy that governments might pursue, is not going to promise nearly as much. And I think the, the new UK loan guarantee scheme is a, is a species of, of, of trying to reduce the interest rate. It's a way of trying to reduce the interest rate that businesses will have to pay on new loans. Um, so the, the, you then get on to the, um, if, you, sorry, if you believe that what's holding the economy back is the cost of doing business, then the supply siders have a coherent uh, program. But I don't think, um, I don't think um, uh, that is uh, what's holding the economy back. The Keynesians would say not that the cost of business is too high, but that demand is too low, and that a higher level of demand would justify most of the existing costs. So that's where you have to go. Uh, I think I've made my own position clear. It's not that we can't do many things to improve supply, but the priority is to increase demand. So how do we do that? I'll answer, I'll be very happy to answer questions on that. Um, and I don't want to say too much about the special position of Ireland. Um, I think Ireland is in, 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 a, in a particularly, particularly bad situation. Um, because it's constrained in its pursuit of any expansionary policy by its membership of the Eurozone. This uh, stops it from either devaluing the currency or printing money, and it also limits its access to credit markets. Now, I think Ireland has gained a bit from the depreciation of the Eurozone, Euro against sterling, but it's not been much. And it can't do very much to stimulate its own domestic demand, given the market's uh, view of um, uh, public finance, and given that it hasn't got a central bank that can print money. And I think that has saved the British economy um, uh, um, and, and, and enabled it to, in a way, enabled it to offset um, what would otherwise be savage deflationary policy um, of the government. Um, so, what then should happen? When I was in Dublin a couple of years ago, um, I urged Irish ministers to join with European colleagues to try to get the Eurozone authorities to reverse their austerity policies. And there is some change in, uh, in that happening. But since then, the crisis has got a lot worse. And uh, although I would still advise exactly the same thing today, I'm, it may, that may be too late to save the Eurozone itself. Um, and if the Eurozone breaks up, which I think is quite possible, that would be a completely different ball game um, with large dangers, but also fresh opportunities. I'd like to end on that note, um, and I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs>